here. Um, I get to speak with Rosemary, and you're a librarian at the Auraria campus. Right. Okay, so why don't you expand on your job and a little bit about your background. Well, the Auraria Library, you know, serves University of Colorado Denver, Metropolitan State University, and the Community College of Denver, so we're a very eclectic library. I um, became a librarian 30 years ago, got my degree at Indiana University, and then I tested into the archival field because when I was a young person, there was no archival education. And so I've been at Auraria now for 16 years, and I began as a cataloger, and when the former archivist retired, I moved up to archives and special collections. Excellent. And so I'm a tenure track faculty in the anthropology department at mm -hmm. UC Denver, so we're colleagues. This is my first time actually meeting you in person. I was right. drawn to you because you have an interesting repository that you've been uh, overseeing. So tell us the name of the repository and give us a, some details about it. Well, it doesn't really have a formal name. I refer to it as my marijuana periodical collection. And I started doing it kind of by accident. Um, Cush, Colorado, volume one, number one, came to my attention like, oh, four years ago, before Amendment 64. And I've been a librarian a long time, so I've seen a lot of volume one, number ones. And a lot of times, there's never another volume. So I just started collecting these things, and I kind of relied on an informal network of people just to bring them to me. But I finally decided I was pretty inefficient. And one day, I drive past three of these places on my way home. At like dispensaries? Yes. Okay. So one day, I just zipped into one, took in my little card. And with my purple hair, you know, people kind of remember me. And I said, oh, can I have your magazines? And they were like really mystified. They had to call the manager. Can we give her these things? And so I just kept doing this. And I would give my card to all of these people. My husband was like kind of upset. He's like, when the police shut these places down, your card is going to be everywhere. <laughs> well. It just kept going and going, and eventually I developed a relationship with three dispensaries, and the staff there just saved the magazines for me. Oh, God, that's great. So once a month, I would just go in, and they would hand me a whole big armful of magazines, and I would take them back to the library. But eventually, even that got to be a problem, because one of the places was raided by the feds. Oh. Another one changed ownership, and all the staff changed, and I had to explain myself all over again. And then the third one, it was like, whoa, no one's bringing us this stuff anymore. So I had to start all over again. But eventually one day, I went online, and I just looked at one of these magazines, because supposedly they all have online editions. Right, right, you can see them on the internet. So I just went online, and I just emailed them, and I said, why don't you give us a comp subscription. One of the things that worked for me was in 2012, Westward did an article about our little collection. And from that, two local publishers contacted me and gave me their back files. And then a law firm that specialized in marijuana defenses donated a bunch of stuff that they had collected. Oh, that's great. So it's like, wow, my collection expanded like right away. And so is the collection, we're talking hard copies, so people come in yes. and actually can hold them. I'm very old school. I, maybe archivists younger than me can buy into this, but I have a hard time believing that in 35 years that online content will still be there mm -hmm. and be available. So I like the the, heart, the physical copy, that sensory <laughs> right. experience. And so um, could the collection fit on this table or like how oh, many? Oh, no. This is it. I mean, mm. the shelves above and below these things are, are filled. filled with it. Wow. And so you've gone through um, several of these, obviously. So which one, I mean, you mentioned Kush, but which one stands out and why? You know, they all do in a certain sense in their own way. In the beginning, 
I just lumped them all together as marijuana periodicals. But as I looked at them and as it went on, there were advocacy magazines, there were lifestyle magazines, like this rooster here mm -hmm. purported to be a lifestyle magazine, but their first like five or six issues were nothing but marijuana related. Now they've evolved into a more lifestyle magazine. But on the other hand, there was a magazine called Savoring the City that began as a lifestyle magazine, published two issues, and went out of business. Mm. Two years went by, legalization happened, and now they've relaunched, and they're a lifestyle cannabis magazine. And so all of these things have a certain little niche. Cush, Colorado stood out because in the beginning they didn't even pretend to be like medical marijuana. They had foldouts of scantily clad women <laughs> clutching marijuana buds. Um, but here's the thing, they've, they're still, Cush was the first one to go out of business. Mm. As soon as legalization happened, they published in four states, California, Colorado, Michigan, and New York. As soon as legalization happened, they stopped publishing. Wow, so what you're doing by collecting them, you're making them available for students, researchers, oh, yeah. community members. Have you found an interest, like people coming in and saying, hey, I want to look at these? Like, right after I started it, I had an international student from in the Middle East who had to do a writing assignment on a cultural sort of disconnect. And the country he came from doesn't have any legalized drugs. And so he came and looked at these things and then wrote a little essay oh, about contrasting the culture. Well, it seems to me, I think, um, sooner than later, you need to be called like the cannabis librarian. <laughs> So, so we can ensure that people know that these are available. So in my job, my day job as a professor, as a researcher, to me, this is gold because I could, for example, create a, an analysis, a content analysis, and try to trace through the magazines how stories were told and, and presented that deal with mold and powdery mildew. So there may be a few I, or there may be a lot, but it, it seems like a great source to try to get a handle well, on that. Well, in fact, one of these magazines, Ganja Gazette, it was another one of those that I had one issue, and it was on newsprint. I never saw another one for two years, and it was an, an advocacy thing. It relaunched, and now it's a social life and customs type magazine. Their mission is to tell our stories through cannabis. I like that. Which is why I thought it would be great for your class. Yeah, well, even the show, this is uh, called Getting High on Anthropology, a story-based approach to cannabis research, education, and funding. So there's no doubt stories sort of spin the globe. And it's nice to know that those um, early uh, publications um, kind of took that emphasis. So a question for you would be, I kind of gave you one idea I have for a project, but what would be, like, if you could guide someone, a community member or a professor or a student, what would be a good project that people could create using those, the materials that you have? Well, what I want to see is just what you've described. I want to see a content analysis of it. To me, all of these things that we're collecting, this is not the academic stuff. This is the social life and customs. Mm -hmm. It's how people deal with it day to day. It's the advertising, that first Cush Colorado, when I saw it, it was like, there's real money behind it. Real photographers, real magazine layout people, real advertising. It's like some slacker didn't throw that together in his mom's garage. Right, there's some thought behind right. it. Right, and so on the one hand, I mean, for years, High Times was the only publication there was, and I never knew anyone that would admit to <laughs> having it. <laughs> but suddenly, it's like all of this stuff, once, the, once Amendment 64 began, this stuff, it just bloomed. Yeah, well this I mean, is- There um, was a lot of it. So let's just take a second, um, briefly, tell people how they can access them. So just, it, is there a website, or how can yes. they find you if they want to learn more? at the Auraria Library, go online to our website and just type in keyword marijuana periodicals. 
And there's all of these things are cataloged. They have to be, you have to come to special collections and use them. They can't be checked out unless I have a good relationship with the professor that I trust. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's great. You can take your own digital photos. We can do photocopies. We can make this work. That's great. Now, I definitely am an advocate to ensuring more people know about it and also get some great projects within the classroom, but also outside the university. Um, so just so people have an idea of the direction that you're going, um, by this time next year, so let's say June 2017, where do you think we'll be with this collection? And first of all, is there, is there you don't have a formal name for the collection, right? No, I don't have a formal name. And in fact, I, I just started doing it kind of haphazardly. Um, I don't really have a mandate from the university to do this. I just thought it was important and thought, oh, I'll start doing this. Um, I would like to see more use made of it. I want to see a doctoral dissertation started, a, a thesis, a published article, anything. <laughs> One of the things is we have to prove our worth. Exactly. So if people don't use this, some numbers cruncher is going to go hmm what's that worth right no this is great again i haven't yet had a chance to see the collection so i hope uh, maybe as we roll into the fall semester i can meet with you and definitely get a better handle so i can educate students um, and i don't think it's uh, uh, too difficult to plan in the medium term to get some kind of academic manuscript or at least because i'm sure you see a lot of visual imagery you mentioned the book the bud and the woman or whatever i'm sure there's some other compelling images that you've seen, right, in some of these publications? Right. Oh, as an addition to this, I have a little box filled with ephemera, which is like any odd thing not already described. And so that's like little brochures, little cards, little stuff. After the Westward article, some guy brought me a bag of that kind of stuff, and it's like, you can't catalog that stuff <laughs> on its own, so I just threw it in a box, and it's like, oh, someday I'll call it the marijuana ephemera collection. <laughs> oh, I like that. I mean, it wouldn't be unusual maybe to say, you know, when I walk through the Denver airport to my flight to see an exhibit with this uh, right. stuff, probably from industry shows or, you know, because I get all this paraphernalia, whether it's little jars or a little thing to zip your weed in. Like, there's all right. this stuff that is branded with either the marijuana leaf or something that's, uh, you know, um, a symbol of the industry. Some of the cool titles I've gotten in here, I have two industry trade publications, which are the magazines that are selling things to the shops to sell things to other people. And then I got hooked in with some business to business magazines. So there's a guy in Seattle, Washington that publishes Marijuana Venture. And I feel real fond of him because I have a long email correspondence with him. Now I know their whole story, how they happen to get into the business. And it was just opportunity. You know, there's money to be made here. So yeah, and I'm they've actually, been in the newspaper business. And no, that's great. I'm actually familiar with that publication. I find it useful. It's a great publication to hold up to say, these are the kind of individuals in the industry that are actively trying to not be part of like stoner culture. Right. Because no, there's this internal exactly tension. It. And so I'm sure with the collection, you got the traditional stoner culture right. stuff that people embrace and maybe sometimes use it derogatorily. But then there's people who are like the businessman and we want to give you tips on, you know, being right. an entrepreneur or whatever. THC, the hemp connoisseur, when the Westward article was published, they were the ones that locally said, oh, take our back file. And it was the same thing. The guys had worked for other publishers mm. and said, why don't we do this ourselves? And so they focused on hemp just in case Amendment 64 didn't pass. Oh. But then when it passed, they reorganized and now they've embraced Okay, <laughs> so if you were to talk to other librarians, like if we went around the state, I'm sorry, around the country, and you were able to talk to like the Ivy Leagues, the Stanford, Berkeley, would you encourage them, or what advice would you give them if they want to um, launch something like this? Well, go for it is my feeling. At this point, when I started doing this, we were the only academic library in the whole country that was collecting these things. Mm. Now I think University of Michigan has begun and San Francisco Public has picked up a few. Okay. But it's like 
As an archivist, what we're trying to do is predict what people are going to be interested in 25 years from now. Exactly. And so it's just, it's a crapshoot. Okay, now I would love to see like a, a conference of librarians focusing on, <laughs> on cannabis publications only because, again, I have four years training of doing archival research on formerly secret tobacco industry documents. <laughs> so I understand the value of historical material. Right. And for me as an anthropologist, how to um, mix it and bundle it up with ethnographic data or you know some statistics or whatever. So um, if there's one lesson you get from the show tonight, um, we have Rosemary Evitz from the library on the Auraria campus, and she has a cannabis collection. And the collection is materials that are um, like popular culture material. Right. So what's the criteria that you use to select things to be in the collection? Well, in the beginning, I wanted to stay with cannabis, Colorado cannabis. But the truth is, these guys are so secretive, it is almost impossible to find out where they're really located. So my criteria became, if I pick it up in a shop here in Colorado, it must be Colorado. <laughs> Got it, I like that. No, that, that, cause there, we all know in the Denver metro area, and of course around the state, there's thousands of dispensaries, right. grow houses and other facilities and ancillary services. Right. So it seems like for everything, there's a new, either a traditional like journal, not an academic journal, but like a trade journal, and then there's the popular culture stuff. Right, exactly. And are you finding maybe, like are you fearful because of like the internet and everyone going online, getting their news, reading blog posts, that maybe these tangible hard copy things would be fading away or you don't see that? Why no. do you think that? I'm old school. I have long experience of people calling me up and saying, oh, my hard drive crashed. I need my dissertation. I need my thesis from 25 years ago. Oh my God, and the library has that stuff. Right. Okay. So, no, I, or no, things that are on the internet last year might not be there next year. So. And so what would you recommend for uh, people like me, you know, I'm very lucky and fortunate, I'm a professor, so I, I can make noise in the university, uh, students, um, adjunct uh, instructors, community members, what can they do to support this or somehow get involved? Well, I would say just come in and use it, write your articles, do popular culture things, do this kind of TV show, it's great. Streaming show, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, this is, uh, yeah, just to remind people, you're watching Getting High on Anthropology. My name's Marty Otanias. We have Rosemary Everett Evitz uh, with the Auraria uh, Library on the Auraria campus. She's a special, special cannabis collections librarian. <laughs> That's the title I'm giving you. Um, and so I do have a very long website, uh, just basically the, the uh, suffix is special collections, but you can go to the Auraria Library, type right. in marijuana and find this stuff. Right. Okay. So. Uh, and again, if you're comfortable, do you have an association with cannabis culture? Like, you know, were you as a youngster collecting comic books that dealt with cannabis or? No, I, I was, I graduated from college in 1976 whenever, you know, it was still illegal. And we always said, oh, there's so much money here. Will this ever be legal in our lifetime? Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's really amazing. Excellent. So when people come, because I know um, if they come and visit your, your collection, can you just take us through the process of, of is the library free for pub, pe people from the Absolutely. public? Absolutely. And, and then they you just do knock not on your need door? You go to any of the schools. You can just walk in off the street. It makes you a non-affiliated patron. <laughs> but I count you in my stats. Um, and you just come in, ring the doorbell, and we'll bring the stuff out and let you see it. Excellent. Would you consider in the future maybe actually us in the room with the collection and talking oh, yeah, more deeply I about it. I would love that. Yeah, I, I think that it. would, I think our viewers that would appreciate it and I think there's just so much rich material and I think even between, between now and when we actually do it, some oh, yeah. new things will come out. I'm sure there will. So Rosemary, we're gonna end there. Okay. Uh, maybe just for fun, is there one word that kind of summarizes what you do? Like one word, either what you do or how you're feeling about your job? It's great, it's the best job ever. That's great, all right. So we, um, thank you Rosemary Evitt, Special Cannabis Collections Library at the Auraria Campus here in um, Denver. So we're gonna take a short break and come back quickly. We're gonna have um, Jolene Donahue with the OSHA Connection.
Golden Goat is a great housewarming gift. Adam, my wife's friend, came to visit one day and he brought a freshly packed bowl. Up to this point, I had always been skeptical of cannabis culture and Adam because he grew his own flower. Kate, my wife, said, Don't worry, you're smoking a natural plant and Adam is great company. The velvety taste and vibrant green color are things I won't forget about that night. The three of us talked and joked for hours. Adam and I have more in common than I thought. Maybe it was the cannabis talking. Anyways, the herb relaxed and helped me deepen my friendship with Adam. We enjoy barbecuing brats and onions in our backyard in Denver. After ripping a fresh bowl, Adam and I usually talk intensely about the problems of illegal marijuana and how the criminalization of cannabis wrecks lives of ordinary people who use or possess weed. A few people I know have a problem with cannabis legalization. To me, cannabis means friendship. My wife and I have separate friends. We dated for nearly six years before we were married. During that time, I wasn't too good at getting to know her friends. Sure, I was polite with them, but I was reserved and for some unknown reason, I was unable to share my views on political issues. In 2011, I began to serve four long years in the military. I dragged my wife with me to Yuma, Arizona, far from Chicago, where we grew up and far from her friends. I meant it when I told her that after I complete my service, we would move anywhere she wanted. Around the same time, several of her friends moved to Denver to start new lives and we wanted to be a part of their story too. Little did I know that cannabis was the vehicle for me to develop a genuine friend. At first, I saw Adam as a stoner who grows his own flower at home. With a few bowls under our belts, I changed my mind. When you invite me to your new house, expect a freshly packed bowl of golden goat as your housewarming gift. So we have a guest tonight. Um, we have Jolene Donahue with the OSHA Connection. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and I have a website I want to make sure people get, theoshaconnection.com. So uh, Jolene, why don't you tell us what is the OSHA Connection? Absolutely. The OSHA Connection is a company that is a business consulting firm. We help employers in the cannabis industry with on-site consultation, training, and education. Excellent. And so you have extensive training or experience in cannabis cultures. Like, is that how you got into this? Or what's the connection with you and your background in this whole marijuana industry? Um, so I didn't start off initially in the cannabis industry. We've been in business for a number of years before that. But I had two things come into light. I had an, a friend of mine that was working as a manager at one of the shops that had a lot of concerns that I figured out that I could help her with. Um, so that was one. And then two, I work a, a lot with Make-A-Wish and we have kids that are out here to treat for medical marijuana. And it really just tugged at my heart. I wanna make sure these employers and their employees are safe so that they can stay in business, so they can continue to help some of the kids that I'm working with. Okay, so I'm familiar with occupational health and safety issues. Would it be um, reasonable to say what you do? You help employers remain OSHA compliant? Is that, yes. okay, so what does that mean? Well, we come out and we'll do an on-site consultation. What we find is there's a lot of regulations that employers don't even know exist. They think that they have a safe environment until we come out and we say, <laughs> you need to work on this, this, and this. And, and they really find out that there are some areas that they didn't know were hazards because their hearts are in the right place. Um, and so we help them understand what the hazards are and how to fix it so that they don't have a problem later. Okay, so you've actually been into grow houses. Yes. Okay, so what would be in order of like uh, intensity, what would be one or two of the kinds of health hazards or occupational hazard hazards that you've seen like a pattern or, or so with the work you're doing? So there, one of the first things we see is exit signs and rooms that are unmarked. We have the fire department that comes in, other regulatory agencies that come in, but they have a different focus. And the OSHA standards are very specific on what those signs have to look like. And so we find a lot of times they're not marked appropriately. In the event of an emergency, it would, you know, could lead to not having an exit. Right, you need to have a way out, and you got to right. have a clear exit signs. Right. Okay. Um, the second thing we find a lot is electrical problems. Again, we have electricians that come in, but there's misunderstandings about what is actually a best practice or an OSHA regulation versus what you need to actually power the lights okay. or power the equipment. And so we've got moist environments with a lot of electrical equipment, a lot of temporary wirings being used that we need to 
you know, make into a hardwire situation. Now, are you hopeful or do you see like, oh my gosh, with all these dispensaries and all these grow houses that there's so many problems that need to be addressed? Or like, how do you feel about where we're at with these kinds of conditions or, or concerns? I think it's really at the, the infancy stages. Most of the owners that we're working with are finally at a point where they're more comfortable with the regulata um, regulatory side that's coming from the Marijuana Enforcement Division, some of the other regulatory agencies, the Department of Agriculture, and so now they can actually focus on some of the other backseat pieces, which would be the OSHA component. Got it. And so for clarification, if I'm an owner and I have maybe 20, 30 employees with a big giant warehouse, um, what are a couple things I can do so when you came in, I'm either prepared or I just make sure I nail above and beyond the, uh, the signs for the exits? Um, and, and, and basically, I want to kind of understand the other issues associated with health and safety. Um, so there's... I'm not quite clear on your question. So, <laughs> that was so, pretty broad, um, so. so would you say right now workers are using, for example, personal protective equipment, which is that stuff they, they to protect their health? Um, have you seen problems where there's lapses in PPE? Uh, and so just, yeah, trying to learn about those kinds of things that employers would be concerned with. Gotcha. Absolutely. And there is, there's a, there's a huge gap there. And it's just that understanding piece. So each chemical that's on site has a safety data sheet associated with it and tells you what you should or shouldn't use. That's the employer's first stop is to take a look at what they have. And then we'll know what personal protective equipment needs to be there. We're finding a lot of employees don't know that they have to have a certain type of safety glass depending on what type of lights are being used. And there's different components I and mean, there's different glasses that you need depending on what type of lights are being used. Um, also respirator use. There's a, a lot of misunderstanding around the pesticides or other fungicides that are being used um, in addition to chemicals where respirators are being used where employees should have a fit test, a medical evaluation before they even put one on and training associated with it. Okay, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned pesticides because in Denver and Colorado generally we hear of all the um, uh, problems associated with pesticide use, specifically some uh, growers, some companies using pesticides that are not appropriate or actually harmful. Right. And so um, with that particular issue, uh, when you go to these facilities, are you concerned about your health or there's not really any issues because of, uh, they're not just out there spraying wildly? Like is that, are you concerned about any exposure to contaminants or pesticide or other chemicals? I'm not at this point. I haven't been in a situation that's drawn me to concern. Most of those um, processes are very structured and controlled, and so the exposure would be limited to certain time frames. So you don't spray anything, you know, 24 hours a day. Gotcha. It's during limited times, and we don't go into rooms during that time. But what I'm finding a lot is with the heavy regulatory piece looking at the pesticides that are being used, the products that are being used, is a lot of times you don't need a respirator. We do it because we don't know what we have. Mm. And so there's education on that side too, that you don't actually need a respirator. You, this is a, a product that actually is safe for you. Gotcha. No, that's good to know. Again, I think we all want the industry to succeed and we want workers to be uh, protected. So let's say there are those few that um, have violations. Explain like the kinds of penalties or like what's that process like if I get um, you know, some kind of notice that says I have a violation. Right. So OSHA would come in and do an inspection first and foremost, and during their exit interview, they would go over any concerns that they have. But outside of that, they will give you in writing what their concern is and what their fines are. They start out right now at $7,000 for a serious or another citation, which is most of them. In another month and a half, it's going to go up to $12,000. Oh, so they're changing the structure of the penalties. They are. This is the first time in 25 years they're actually increasing the fines. They're over um, close to doubling, and we're not sure of the final numbers yet. Mm. Um, so they take that, and then they'll, they have a formula. They'll, they'll reduce the fine down, so it's hard to say what the final fine would be. Um, it has to do with history, number of cases that you've had, what the actual exposure was, and then they'll make a reduction from there. Okay. And then with the, um, uh, your years, because you have a couple years experience in the cannabis sector, right? Yes. So have you seen the numbers of penalties or people who have, who've had violations? Has it skyrocketed because the beginning of, you know, um, uh, REC and MED in 2014, has there been a jump or has it just been flat? The, the... Um, it, there's, it's just been steady. Mm. Um, because There's confusion because it's not yet federally sanctioned. And OSHA in Colorado is a federal entity. The federal government still can come in, but they'll come in on a referral from another regulatory agency 
they will come in on a complaint, which is what we see most often, um, or some other concern that's raised in the community. Yeah. What they don't have is those random inspections as of yet. Mm. But once they've been at one facility, if you have two, let's say you have a sister grow, they can actually inspect every one of your buildings. Ah, okay. So what kinds of complaints would people have? Like, are you familiar with any of the cases and the language that people use? Like, what would be the yeah. range of these? Most often it comes from that lack of education, not knowing the hazard communication piece. And most of the complaints we've seen so far have been employees that are using products that they don't know what they are. And so they have called OSHA and said, hey, we're using this, I'm scared. Whereas just a little bit of education in the forefront would prevent that. Okay. Um, the other side of it has just been uh, just complaints from disgruntled employees, um, people that have been terminated. Every case that I've come across has been justly so. And then they're, they're using fraudulent information to present a case to OSHA. Gotcha. And so are you hopeful, like with um, any changes that might come down the road in the next year or so, that there be um, some improvements in health and safety regulations? Or is there any um, upcoming change that you think might happen based on your knowledge of the health and safety area? I, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of changes as far as the OSHA regulations go and as far as that part of the industry goes. Mm -hmm. It more is just there's an increased awareness and it's time to start focusing on employee safety and not just the product. So the okay. product we've got pretty stable, and now we've got to start working on some of the other components. Yeah. The OSHA regulations are pretty standard, so there, there haven't been a lot of changes, which is nice, because once we put the systems in place, an employer is able to do it without a consultant, without somebody there on site. They can have that already in there and maintained at that point. Okay. So I've been very lucky. I've had some conversations with you uh, in the past, and I've been fortunate to also take two classes through the Department of Ag, Department of Agriculture Worker Protection Standards. And so what I learned there, and I think I just want to clarify this. So I was told the Department of Ag regulations end when the cannabis plant is cut, and then OSHA takes over. But from what you told me uh, a while back, that that's not necessarily the case. So right. can you kind of clarify that? Sure. Um, that's a great question. The Department of Ag's um, part might stop at that point, but OSHA actually applies the entire time. So OSHA, once you have one employee or more, OSHA regulations apply. And they don't stop or start with any other regulatory agency. They apply as they are. Okay. So they're covered, um, uh, health and safety issues are covered from like seed to, to shelf or whatever. Right. Okay. And then just a little bit more about um, as this area blossoms and we find more and more people coming into the sector, what, would, <coughs> what advice would you have for people if they want to do something like what you're doing, to, to either be uh, an expert in health and safety or to do trainings? Because I, I think you also do trainings, is that right? Right. Um, so uh, attending those training and trainer classes, there's a lot of resources that not only my company has, but OSHA regulation or OSHA.gov actually has as well. There's template programs out there there is structure to help employers get to that point. If they were going to be in health and safety, um, my first stop I would say is to go to the Rocky Mountain Education Center. Okay. That's where OSHA goes for training. We also train classes there too, um, which is kind of nice because we train OSHA what they're looking for oh, before excellent. they come out and look. So that's really the, the first step if you're gonna start a career in health and safety. Okay, so do you have any upcoming trainings or up any, any um, events coming up that you think it'd be nice to share with people? Um, we don't have classes specific for the cannabis industry there as of yet. Mm -hmm. I'm still working on that piece. Um, but there's always a general industry course, and that's where this, this industry falls, is within the general industry. So there's um, a 30-hour course coming up within the next two months. Oh, excellent. Um, on, we're able to do on-site 10 and 30 hours for cannabis clients, and we do tailor that. So if you wanted us to come out and do a 10-hour course and go over what the department's going to look at, we tailor it specific for cannabis while meeting the OSHA regulations. Got it. So those those clients would walk away with the Department of Labor card saying that they actually attended an OSHA 10 hour. Ah, okay. So just to go deeper, because um, as you know, at the University of Colorado Denver, I teach a course called Cannabis Cultures. So we just have one module that deals with health and safety and worker issues. But what would be kind of briefly the the things that would be in like the dream course if you can teach at uh, you know one of these institutions or to do like a long course what would be the sort of modules that would be in it um, so for a, a longer course just health and safety related um, specifically the respirator piece hazard communication electrical um, the pesticide which is coupled with the Department of Labor's worker protection standard 
um, just really raising those awarenesses and helping people understand what their exposures actually are and how to protect themselves. Okay. Um, I'd love to learn more about, um, you know, the regulations because I know um, with the limited knowledge I have of people in the industry, it's a full-time job just keeping up on all the regulations. <laughs> so with you and your very specialized area, how do you do it? Like, how do you stay on top of it and um, be informed and to ensure that there's, um, that you're following everything the way it should be done? Well, I, I have a, a really strong background of having those inspections and attending them, and so that's a, that's a good place to start. I also am the instructor for the update class, and so I have to be on their website all the time. I have to be looking through the regulations and seeing whatever comes up. Um, they have a couple of distributions that they send out that tell you what regulations have changed, what's also coming up on the docket. I, I follow that um, as to what's going to be coming up, what regulations are looking at for change. Historically, there haven't been a lot of changes up until the last two or three years, and now there's been changes all the time. Okay. But they do put it out there so that you can find out what it is. Right. Wow. No, this is fascinating because I'm really interested in, um, you know, what I can do as a researcher, as an anthropologist, as a media maker to draw attention to health and safety issues. Um, would you say, uh, is there, when you look at these issues and go into the actual facilities and learn how they're all connected um, in terms of the workers and employers, is there tension between the two parties? Like, do you find maybe workers pull you aside and say, hey, let me really tell you what's going on? Or Fortunately, not a whole lot. Um, it's been very well received. What I'm finding more often is that managers and supervisors are saying, please come in and help us. And so it's more of trying to help the owners see that there really is a need at this point. Again, that confusion with the federal sanction. Um, they really want to do the right thing. Yeah. People want to be protected. They want to know what they have to do so that they can do it right. Okay. And so I'm really finding just a sincere desire to do the right thing. Excellent. So just so people know, one more time, uh, tell folks the name of the company and then your website. So it's the OSHAConnection.com. Um, make sure there's the T-H-E in there or it doesn't go through. And it's um, my phone number, if you want that, one eight seven seven six four six four nine seven four. Great. So and that, uh, sorry, uh, maybe one more time, say the phone number. It's one eight seven seven six four six four nine seven four. Great. One of the things I really enjoy when I learned about your work is you have an innovative way of communicating with your potential clients where they could film in their facility and then send you uh, the material. So explain that process and why would you do that? Right. So we've been doing a lot of virtual tours. It's been fun. And we don't always have the time to have a consultant come in and ask questions. Sometimes I need to just look at a certain area very quickly. And so you can take your iPad, you can take your phone and do a sweep of an area slowly or look at a specific question and send it over and we can take you take it back and give you some recommendations based on that. Okay, no, it sounds convenient because you, for those hard to reach places, you know, it's a nice um, option to use uh, whatever, iPhone, iPad, to get the media and then you look at it, inspect it, and then give some kind of uh, response to them. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, we've got clients nationwide, so we've helped employers from Maine to Washington State and it's a great way to, to be able to, to expand those resources. Oh, that's great. Um, so would you say in the area of cannabis and occupational health and safety, is it something that, um, is it becoming oversaturated with the researchers and educators and consultants, or is it still like this area that it's just so new because there's been more focus on the consumer end? Um, it's not saturated with the health and safety at this point. Um, that still is kind of coming up on the, on the forefront. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure of the other consultants. Mm. I, I have a, a select few that I work with pretty diligently, but um, it's starting to come up more and more. So I suspect that there will be more help out there. Okay. And I think um, with your organization, you probably get this a lot, that there may be confusion. You have the OSHA connection, and then there's OSHA. So maybe right. one more time, talk <laughs> about the difference between those two and right. how do you augment or support each other? Right. So I am not affiliated with OSHA in any way. Uh, it's an independent consulting firm, and we really are there to help employers make that an easy, make it an easier connection. If you're receptive and, and working on the prevention side, when OSHA comes in, it's not a big deal, and you can have a citation-free visit. And so we, we help with with making that separation, with making that connection between what that big, huge book of regulations says you have to do with what you can actually do and, and how to make it workable. Got it. I think in my lifetime both of ours, we may see cannabis be descheduled. Okay, so. possibly it may happen sooner than later. So would that be a good thing or bad thing with the work that you do? Like, wh what do you think may happen with, with it not being illegal at the federal level? 
Um, I think that there's going to be an increase in inspections. Uh, there's, it puts them in the random list like every other employer, which automatically there's going to be more interest mm. and so more likely to be inspected. There's also times when um, there's going to be a lot more phone calls as far as, as you know, people wanting to get OSHA in there to take a look at different things. Okay. Yeah, so hopefully we'll see something happen soon. Yes. And then that may even create more work or uh, we'll find um, uh, employers doing the right thing and protecting uh, folks. So what would you say, um, and then we just have a minute to wrap up, what would you say to a worker who has concerns, like how, where would they go to address concerns that they feel the employer is not effectively addressing them along health and safety lines? An, um, an employee, a cannabis worker. So I, th their first stop really is that supervisory piece and, and getting the information they need there. A lot of times they're not making that connection. And so your first stop, I get calls from time to time from employees, and, and the first mm. stop really is to talk to your employer. A lot of times they just don't know that there's something out there. So um, I would direct them back there first, but they can always reach out to OSHA or one of the other regulatory agencies as well. So Jolene, thank you so much for talking with us. I think the information and the work you're doing is incredible, and um, I look forward to hearing more about it in the future. Great, thank you so much for having me here today. Excellent, stay tuned. Yeah. We'll be right back with Joel Warner, staff writer with the International Business Times. If I put all the weed I've smoked since I first started seven years ago out onto a table, there wouldn't be enough room. Between bowls, blunts, dabs, and bong rips, I could fill a room wall to wall. This may seem crazy to people, but in my eyes and in Colorado, it's normal. Growing up in a split family, I experienced opposite perspectives about marijuana from my divorced parents. My mom caught me smoking weed when I was 15 years old. She found the $5 pipe wrapped inside a sock, inside of a stainless steel water bottle, buried in a drawer in my closet. I remember coming home from my friend's house, still high from smoking with her, feeling paranoid because I didn't like being stoned around my mom. I went straight to my room and made sure my pipe was still safely hidden in my closet. It was gone. I panicked as I heard my mom coming down the stairs. She asked me if there was anything I had to tell her. Nope, I said. Eventually, the truth came out and she grounded me. She gave me the weed is bad and how I was being irresponsible lectures. Then there was my dad. He is one of the biggest pot smokers I know. Our house smelled like a skunk and it never really made sense until I started smoking weed. He hid his cannabis smoking from me, but I knew. One time, my dad got into a fight with his girlfriend. He joined me on the couch, rolled up a joint, and passed it to me. He apologized that our first time had to be that way, but then from that day on, it became normal to smoke with him. It wasn't unusual for him to ask me if I wanted to twist one up or pack a fatty. Eventually my mom came around and realized that I was a successful stoner. Since 16, I had a full-time job, received A's and B's in school, and later when I got an apartment, filled it with marijuana posters, pipes, and bongs. Acceptance from my mom means a lot to me. In my family, cannabis is the new normal. Welcome back. My name is Marty Otanias. This is Getting High on Anthropology. We're at Denver Open Media in Denver. If you haven't been here, it's an incredible facility for um, uh, creating media using some equipment, whether it's video editing programs or cameras that are here in the studio. There's an incredible pool of volunteers and, and friends here that I encourage you to come and get to know them because uh, the purpose of Denver Open Media is to ensure that media gets in the hands of ordinary people so you can create stories, the ones that you think need to be told, instead of having other people tell your stories. Um, so what I've done, I created this show and I have a number of guests and it's to promote knowledge, education, and information about cannabis and cannabis studies. Uh, tonight we have Joel Warner, he's a staff writer with International Business Times. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And so you're a unique staff writer or journalist, you are a cannabis journalist. Journalists. Yes. So why don't you explain what is that and then your background, like how you got into that? If that, is, that is a really good question. It was funny actually, a few weeks ago I was driving uh, my kids home and I had a uh, Colorado Public Radio on and Ryan Warner came on with some, like, some advertisement and he mentioned marijuana and my, and my eight-year-old son says, uh, marijuana, dad you work for marijuana. And I was like, well I don't actually work for marijuana. But I do cover it full time uh, from uh, from my base here in Denver for uh, International Business Times. Um, 
it turns out I've been, I've been covering the marijuana industry here in Colorado for quite a, for quite a while now. I mm -hmm. think I started back in 2008 or 2009. I was a staff writer at Westward Newspaper. And, uh, and as staff writers at Westward, we didn't have particular uh, kind of beats per se. Um, there weren't enough of us to have, for, to have any particular beat. But I started noticing stuff was going on, mm -hmm. where we started having uh, the first of the dispensaries. Um, I think the first one was in Colorado Springs opened up. And I said, this is, this is, this is, this is new, this is unique. So I started writing stories about it for Westward. And I was actually uh, the first marijuana uh, critic nationwide. Wow. Um, I was also the worst marijuana critic nationwide because I didn't have a problem with partaking, but you know, I was a new father, I didn't have much time or money, so I started writing these reviews of the very first dispensaries, um, but it was like writing restaurant reviews without actually sampling the food. Gotcha. So I described the places and I did about uh, three or four and I, and I told uh, the bosses at Westward, look, we have to find someone who can really do this. So I left Westward, I went and wrote a book not about marijuana, um, and then I became a full-time freelancer. So I was uh, writing for a variety of national publications. Okay. Um, and being here in Colorado, this was uh, right before 2014, I realized mm -hmm. that this was a really good kind of time to look at what was going on with somewhere that was, that was gonna legalize and regulate the substance that had never been uh, done before. Yeah. So I partnered with, uh, DU Law Professor um, Sam Kamen, and we did this uh, series for Slate. I called it kind of the Freakonomics of Marijuana, where we looked at these questions that that were just then starting to come up. And what year was that roughly? That was right uh, when we launched the marijuana program here. So mm -hmm. it was late 2013 uh, into 2014. Gotcha. So in like late 2013, we were we were doing stories about what's going to happen with banking, which which now is a big deal, but at that point, no one had really talked about it. So I was writing for Slate about marijuana, I was writing for Vice, Men's Health, Men's Journal. And last spring, uh, International Business Times reached out and said, well, do you want to cover this full time for us, oh, as a staff excellent. writer? And at first I said, I don't know. I didn't know if I wanted to just focus on marijuana full time yeah. as a writer. But um, they said all the right things. They said, look, we, you know, it's not like you have to be writing a story every day. You're not looking for just quick hits. We're looking for someone to actually take some serious time and ask some real kind of deep, thoughtful right. questions about what this means. And actually, in depth stories. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, so far, I've actually really enjoyed it. And I'm not sick of it yet, which is a good sign. Oh, no, that's great. You said so many things. I love the antidote with your kid. Oh my uh, because I have a child, eight, yes. eight and 11. I have two kids. And, and marijuana comes up because they, through osmosis, they hear about yeah. it. And, and so I want to get back to that. But I want to ask you, because of your focus and your expertise in cannabis journalism, have you ever been stigmatized, like with your colleagues or peers or family members, where they kind of like, poo poo it or laugh at it, like any kind of funny story that you have, only because there's still a lot of people who sort of are not into it and, and they just look at this as a bunch of stoners. So I was just curious if you had any kind of uh, story about being stigmatized or That's stereotyped. That's a funny question. I don't think I have as much as you would think. I think maybe it's in part because uh, journalism in general these days um, is pretty liberal. Uh, journalists know that we have to kind of branch out into these new topics. One of the few examples I would say is maybe uh, my wife's grandmother keeps saying, "What is Joel covering? Is he covering heroin?" So I think <laughs> I think she purpose I think she might be saying on purpose like, "No, heroin is not legal yet in right. Colorado. It might next year, but so far it's not. So I'm not covering." legalized heroin yet. No, oh, that's great. Yeah, because I think part of my battle is just creating positive stereotypes, trying to ensure, like even my mom, I have to deal with, you know, she thinks everyone in Denver is just stoned out of their mind. Yes. And so these are just part of the, the work that we do. Um, so is there a recent story that you've done um, with your, your writing um, that you're jazzed about? Like, can you tell us about one of the most recent um, stories? Well, there's a story, I think it's coming out uh, next week that I'm working on for quite a while. Um, and this is one of the benefits that I have at International Business Times where they give me a very long leash and I can spend a lot of time on a story, mm -hmm. but I feel like it really deserves it. Um, so for quite a while now, I've been hearing anecdotes about uh, that there were folks uh, coming to Colorado with very few resources, uh, lured here because of legalized marijuana, either to partake recreationally or medically or to look for jobs mm -hmm. within uh, the business and ending up at local shelters. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and can you explain what you mean by local shelters? Yeah, uh, Denver-based uh, homeless shelters, also down in Pueblo, in Colorado Springs. But these were just anecdotes. Um, as we've found in the state, there's just not a lot of hard research in a lot mm-hmm. of these trends. So I decided I wanted to figure out was there any real kind of truth to the right. stories I've been hearing. And what I had to do was kind of go shelter by shelter, service by service, and ask the managers, look, have you seen an increase? Have you seen any real impacts? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that most of them say yes. Uh, Basically, it came down to the most uh, shelters say between 20 and 30% of their newcomers say they've come to Colorado in part because of marijuana. Wow. Yeah, and it's not happening in in Washington State. It's not happening in California or anywhere else. It's just Colorado for whatever reason. So I didn't want to just report this. I wanted to kind of put a face to it. So I told the shelters, look, if you find one unique individual who kind of fits the bill and they'd be willing to let me shadow them, as we say uh, in the business, let me know. And so I ended up connecting with this young man named uh, Devin Butts, who had arrived one, uh, basically, one day in early April on a bus from Texas. Mm -hmm. Arrived in Pueblo, was staying at the the, um, the rescue mission down there, and I met up with him like the day after he got to Colorado, and I oh, shot him for a day great, to just kind of great time to kind of capture his life. Yeah. So that story is coming out. Next okay. Week. So, so what you're suggesting um, when we look beneath the veneer of the cannabis sector, there's certain elements that aren't necessarily benefiting, or there's obstacles for people to get the job they need to sustain themselves. Yeah, I mean, you know, like any new developing industry, it's, it's, it's incredibly complicated. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you know from your work, there are so many stories. And there's so many stories that aren't being captured right. because no one's sending out press releases on these stories. And, I'm, and my background is as a long-form journalist. I was a staff writer at Westward mm-hmm. where I write 5,000 words. I was writing kind of features for national publications. So my passion lies in kind of magazine-style narrative nonfiction. So I try to find these stories to help illustrate these bigger issues. That's great. So um, like you, as you mentioned, I kind of talk to people, try to capture stories. Um, do you find that you find uh, individuals resistant to talking to you because they don't want their stories made public? Or do you use pseudonyms? Like, How do you deal with people just not willing to talk for one reason or another? Well, one thing I think find really fascinating is, that he, is, is how quickly that stigma for the most part, has evaporated here in Colorado. I remember Mm -hmm. when I first started reporting on this back, um, we started reporting on the legalized sector back in late 2013 or 2014, people were really nervous. They didn't want their photos taken, they didn't want their names. Now you go to these marijuana yoga events where there's like 50 people (laughs) smoking up and doing yoga and no one has a problem putting their name or their faces out there. Now this is just Colorado. I spent time in California uh, last summer, lived on a marijuana farm up in Mendocino County, mm-hmm. and there folks were still very protective ah. and very, very nervous. So in some ways it's fascinating to see, at least here in Colorado, how quickly that stigma has kind of moved away. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because in my course, I just finished teaching a course called Cannabis Cultures at UC Denver in the Anthropology Department. And as part of the course, students create these videos, these stories, first person digital stories. And 18 of the students made these projects. I would say 15 or more were fine talking about their consumption habits and basically wearing the stoner um, emblem on their sleeve. Like they didn't have a problem outing themselves. And I think we're finding that increasingly uh, here in Colorado. So the other thing I want to ask you is shifting gears a bit, but with your work, like how are you measured in terms of like, do you have a security of employment as long as you pump out a story once a month? Like what, how do you, how are you assessed? So this is a, one of the big questions, not, not just in marijuana journalism, but I mean journalism in exactly. general these days. And, it's, and it is an issue because now more than ever before, uh, publishers can get what seem like hard numbers in terms of how much impact your stories have. They can look, I mean, Ivy Times is just online. Gotcha. So, so I can see exactly how many hits each of my stories receives mm-hmm. in terms of how many people actually clicked on the story, how many people shared it. Um, now these metrics in, in this kind of new journalism are being questioned, however, because the number of hits a story has doesn't necessarily translate to how much impact it has. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, and thankfully, IB Times has never said I have to hit a certain quota. Oh, good. Unlike a lot of publications where you do, one of the reasons why I said yes when they reached out, and they said, we don't want you caring about how many hits you get. We, we feel like if you do good journalism, 
people, people will come to us. Oh, that's which is, great. Which is really nice. No, that's a good philosophy. Because yes. then you're not stressed just trying to hit numbers and you yeah. can go into now, it. I also have the added benefit is that still these days, anytime you stick the word marijuana in a headline, certain people will be drawn to it. Mm -hmm. So I have this, this kind of buffer with that. So just so people know, if they want to check out your stories, what's the easiest way online for them to find this? Um, Google uh, Joel Warner and International Business Times. Okay. Um, so back to your kid, uh, only because I think it's just so funny, because yeah. I think we all agree we want to keep marijuana out of the hands of kids, yes. you know, because it's just good practice for health reasons, their minds are developing. So you have conversations with your kid because the kid, um, your child, thinks that, you know, you work for marijuana. Uh, my kid, I hear him talking to his friend marijuana is legal in Colorado so I hear him sort of parroting some of the things that I say so have you found it um, like you're in a in a pickle trying to like talk about it openly but you also don't want your kid to see that he has a path you know unless he has epilepsy or some yeah. medical reason has this been uh, something a challenge for you or no big deal I've been thinking about it a lot more lately uh, I haven't actually I hadn't actually broached the subject with him which is funny because I talk about drinking a beer or drinking alcohol so theoretically, it shouldn't be as big a deal, but I think that might be the last vestiges of the stigma that we've had. Um, you know, uh, we've, we've had decades of society understanding the social lexicon around consuming alcohol. You know, um, people from, from a very young age know the difference between having a glass of wine with dinner and someone sitting in a bar and having nine shots. Mm -hmm. um, Kids these days here still don't understand that, so I haven't broached it yet with them, but I've been thinking long and hard about that. It's, it's clearly something that I'm going to have to do soon. And my assumption is, is I'll, I'll broach it in the same way that I broach uh, drinking alcohol these mm -hmm. days. It's, I, think it, I think at this point you, you have to admit, like, no, it's not going to kill you to have one joint. Exactly. Just like it's not going to kill you to have one glass of wine or beer. But. There are serious consequences, serious legal consequences, serious cultural consequences if you consume below the age of 21. Yeah, no, these are things I deal with and it's a process, you know, yeah. the kids, because the kids get more mature and ask more difficult questions and yeah. so it's great. And I, uh, good luck with that and hopefully we'll touch base later because it's an ongoing issue. What I love to know is, uh, you know, I have my students, undergrad students, graduate students, I want them to get a job eventually. So if someone um, aspires mm -hmm. to be a um, cannabis journalist, in 20 seconds, what one piece of advice would you give them? Um, learn the fundamentals of journalism. It's not about cannabis, it's about understanding how to report stories, how to find sources, how to not just write about kind of trends or subjects, but find stories. Excellent. Do the basics of journalism. That's all you need to do. Okay, so Joel Warner, thank you so much for being on the show. 